now I'm going to show you particularly the part where I've been working. Uh, the, the Falkland Islands up here, Bird Island and Gritfigan at South Georgia. These are the South Sandwich Islands. Signy Island in the South Orkney Islands and then the Antarctic Peninsula itself. Can we go up a bit? It's too big. It's too big. <laughs> oh, we might have to come forward a bit then. The picture itself is too big. Too big. That's near enough because I want to go down here. <coughs> the Antarctic Peninsula itself, uh, bases, research stations have been established there for a long time. And then also, this is the Weddell Sea, and then down here you can just see it at the bottom, Halley, which is a very important geophysical station. This is where they make magnetic measurements, measurements of the upper atmosphere, and gravity measurements, and so on and so forth. Now, <coughs> I first went to the Antarctic in 19... 46. It's quite a long time ago, isn't it? And I originally went for just two years, two winters. But unfortunately, the sea ice in the summer of the, my last year, it didn't break up. So the ship couldn't get in, and so I had to stay another year. So altogether, I stayed in the Antarctic for three and a half years, three winters. Now, the third winter, because the ship couldn't get in, we didn't have too, too much food because the ship would have brought more food, food in with us. So we had to ration our food very carefully. Now, <clears throat> I came first of all to Hope Bay at the very northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula in 1946 <clears throat> and I stayed there the whole of that year at the end of 1947 with a Huskies. There were four of us with three teams of Husky dogs. We traveled from there all the way down the east coast of the Antarctic Peninsula to about here and then across the peninsula which is 6,000 feet high to a place called Stonington Island, just here. And, of course, nobody had ever been here before. So we knew that we had to get there, and we knew we were starting here, but all of this was completely new. And on the east coast, there is an ice shelf. Now, the awful thing is that a, a couple of years ago, a lot of this ice shelf that we traveled over broke up and disappeared. We have the pictures from the satellites. It, it, it's just disappeared completely. And here we started off with blank sheets of paper and we had to make the map as we went along all the mountains and glaciers and we made the map all the way down here. Now, you see, it's exciting and one doesn't realize it until you get older that here you've been looking at something that nobody has ever seen before. Nobody. And here you're making the map for the first time. Now, <clears throat> we've been able to check because we have imagery from the satellites of the whole of this Antarctic Peninsula. And the worst error that we've got is three kilometers. Now that isn't bad, is it? Now, I was down here at Stonington Island for uh, two whole years and we traveled down here across Marguerite Bay, down George the Sixth Sound, right down here, down, oh, down to there. <clears throat> this is called Alexander Island. A wonderful place because here there are <clears throat> mostly sediments, and in these sediments are beautiful fossils of shells, plants, and so on. And you imagine this is the first time that anybody had ever been able to collect fossils 
from Alexander Island. In fact, a lot of these fossils were completely new to science. Nobody had ever seen fossils quite like this before. They knew that a shell was a shell, but they didn't know the name of the shell. And we traveled all the way down here, and it was when we were way down here, and I was traveling with a person called Sir Vivian Fuchs, who led the Transantarctic Expedition, that we actually made the plans for the Transantarctic Expedition to cross from here to the South Pole and then to the Ross Sea on the other side. And of course that all happened. And you see, it's fascinating to be able to spend time with somebody. Now, I camped with, with uh, Sir Vivian Fuchs for two and a half years, and we lived in the field in a little teeny weeny tent, only seven feet square. So if you're in that close proximity to somebody, you get to know them pretty, pretty well. And you, you get to know all their nasty little habits, like, you know, we had aluminium plates that we, we ate our food off, and the, you find people would scrape the plate and it would go grr, 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 like this, and then they would sniff. And when you have to put up with this all day and all night, you've got to be a little bit considerate for the other person. Now these are all sidelined things. Um, sorry, I missed one. Now I want to just show you what the Falkland Islands looked like. This is the capital of the Falkland Islands, Port Stanley. The town is on a, a ridge like that. Altogether only 5,000 people live in the Falkland Islands and 2,500 of those live in Stanley. The way today that they communicate with South America is by uh, aeroplane. There's a very big airfield here. You probably heard that there was a, a war involving the Falkland Islands in the early 1980s. The Argentines invaded this place. But I don't want to talk about the Falkland Islands, I want to talk about the Antarctic. Now, we're going to Bird Island. Now this is the sub-Antarctic. You can see it's sub-Antarctic because you see the grass on the hillside. This is tussock grass and it grows about that high. And all in amongst, um, oh, first of all, I must just tell you that this is the research station. A friend of mine um, ran that for quite a long time. And oddly enough, I was reading the newspaper the other day and here in the newspaper there was an article about the population of wandering albatrosses diminishing. And here was his name. His name was John Croxall. And he ran this station very successfully. But the wandering albatrosses are fantastic. Here they are in amongst the tussock grass. Now you know the tussock grass is, is about this high. And here all these wandering albatrosses are above the tussock grass. So their nests are built on perches about that high. They always come back to the same nesting site. The same pairs come to the same nesting site. And we have taken samples of the very early nests and you know that those are about 20,000 years old. Now that's a, a long time. But uh, the wandering albatrosses are so tame, you can walk right up to them. You can touch them. You can stroke them. And all of them have got rings on their legs. You can only see one here, but there's another one down there. <coughs> and we have got We've been studying these birds for a long time now, since about 1950. And we've got wonderful videos. Is that not too good? That's better. And we've got wonderful videos of these birds 
jumping about in their courtship display. This is before they get together and complete their nest. But also, around the shores of Bird Island, there are fur seals. You can see them here. You, you know that the, the whale population in the Southern Ocean has diminished quite a lot because the, the, the whalers have been wiping them out regularly for their, their blubber, the whale oil and so on. And of course the whale lives on krill, little tiny shrimps like this. <clears throat> but the fur seal also lives on krill. And because the whales were dirt eating the krill, the fur seal started eating it, so there was a population explosion. So there are lots and lots of these. Now, funnily enough, these fur seals uh, uh, were used for all sorts of things. Uh, in Europe, a lot of the ladies, the older ladies, had fur seal coats to keep them warm in the winter. And I remember my, uh, my grandmother having one of these fur seal coats, and I'm pretty sure it came from, from Bird Island. <coughs> now, in the tussock grass, you come across a lot of these fur seals. They're quite big. They weigh about a ton and a half, and they're uh, oh, about eight or nine feet long and they are very fierce indeed, particularly in the breeding season. This is a, a big bull uh, fur seal, and if you come face to face with one of those in the tussock grass, you don't feel very well, because he's liable to lunge at you and perhaps bite you. Several friends of mine have been bitten by them, so we always carry with us a bamboo stick and if one of them comes at you like this, what you do is you just tickle his whiskers. And the reason for this is, the, the reason for, for this is <coughs> that when the bull seals get very fierce during the mating season and they attack any of the females, all the females do is they just take a flipper like that and just tickle the whiskers and off the, the fur seals go. So we know all about these fur seals. Now, very close to Bird Island is South Georgia. South Georgia rises to about 9,600 feet. It has a lot of snow and ice on it. There are raised beaches. You see the beach along here? wave cut platforms. This means that the sea level was much higher at some time in the past. South Georgia is a wonderful place. Of course, the, the whalers had been around South Georgia since the 1880s. Now, at South Georgia, there is a little administration well, you can't even call it a village, just a few administration houses. That is called King Edward Point. Here, <clears throat> even till today, they have a magistrate, they have a jail, and a jailer. And the reason why they have this is that a lot of these whalers in the early days were Norwegians who, who liked to uh, drink quite a lot. They used to drink a lot of alcohol and get very, <coughs> well, get very troublesome. They were always up to fights. Quite a lot of murders took place here. And so the magistrate was there to deal with them. Now, this is another view of King Edward Point. <coughs> There is the research station that has been built by the British Antarctic Survey, mainly to, to study the marine life and the birds. Uh, here is the jetty, the main street at King Edward Point, and of course the people there put this up uh, just for the tourists, because a lot of tour ships come to South Georgia. And of course everybody wants to have tea at, or coffee at South Georgia. 
and there is no cafe there at all. But at South Georgia, the weather changes very, very quickly. This photograph was taken only five minutes after the previous one. Here, the, the snow just can come down like that. So you, everywhere you go, you've got to be prepared. You've got to take your anorak with you. You've got to take your gloves with you in case you get frostbite. And you've got to take your map with you and your compass so that you can find your way back if you're a long way off. But the weather does change. It's even worse than the changes that you get here in Sydney. Far worse. Now, at, uh, at uh, Gritbicken, on South Georgia, there is a big whaling station. And it's just, this is part of it. Here is the whaling station itself. That is a little whaling ship. This platform here is called the plan. The whales are winched up onto this platform and they have their overcoats taken off. The blubber, which is about this thick, that, that's taken off there. Then they're winched up onto the next platform and then they're sawn up into pieces and out the other end of the, the whaling factory comes whale oil, meat meal, and bone meal. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. This factory was actually shut down in 1956 uh, because most whaling was abandoned about that time. Did you now, see it operating? Did you see it yes, I did. Yes, I saw it operating in 1946. Did you? Yeah, lovely. And just behind here, just behind here, is one of the southernmost football pitches because all the ships, the whaling ships and so on, of all different nationalities come into Gritviken to take on board water. And of course, all sailors play football, so there are more international football matches played on the pitch. You can see a little bit here, on the pitch behind the whaling station at Gritviken. And they've kept this uh, football pitch going even though the whaling factory is shut. <coughs> that is the dry dock that is still there today. And a lot of the little uh, whalers were put into dry dock to repair them. It's wonderful country. You can walk all about here without any chance of coming to harm. But of course, uh, if you get on a glacier, the problem is different. Now, all the way around the edge of South Georgia, there are penguins. Uh, not the little penguins like this, but these are king penguins. They're about that high. They've got beautiful colors. And also, there are elephant seals. You see, in the breeding season, the elephant seals have a trunk. And they blow it up and puff themselves up and take charge of, of all the, uh, the, the, the lady seals who are on the beach. But these penguins are, are so beautiful, the king penguins. The, big, the other big penguins are the emperor penguins, and I'll tell you about them later. You can go close up to them, but quite often they are on the other side of the melt streams that come off the glaciers. The, in the summertime, the glaciers melt, um, and the water rushes down in these melt streams and you shouldn't try ever to cross one of these because if you lose your footing, next minute you're out to sea. It's very, very, it can be very, very dangerous indeed. Now some of these glaciers are very fierce indeed. They move at quite a rate. Some of them move at the rate of three kilometers a year. As a result, they're all broken, cracked, crevassed and, and so on. And then they have a front across 
which could be as much as 150 feet high. Now, it's not a wise thing to go in a ship close to the snout of one of these glaciers because bits are falling off all the time. There's popping and, and banging and crashing uh, as the glacier is moving. And the popping and banging is because there are air bubbles in the ice and those air bubbles, as the ice melts, those air bubbles burst. They go pop like that. And you can hear them, but thousands of these noises going on all the time. And we've done a lot of research here because these glaciers have advanced and retreated over thousands of years.